Steam giants represented the pinnacle of an evolutionary process that began in 1803, the year English inventor Richard Trevithick built the first steam-powered locomotive to run on rails. Diesel engines changed the rules 150 years later. Unlike hand-built, labor-intensive, and water-gulping steam giants, diesels were mass-produced, economical, and only needed enough water for their crews to drink. By 1960, the diesel's versatility and cost-effectiveness had put steam engines out of business on all major American railroads. Hundreds of jobs were lost. Foundrymen, pipe fitters, and boilermakers suddenly had nothing left to build or repair. It was hard on a lot of people. You take somebody that, that uh, had started out as an apprentice boy, an apprentice boilermaker, had honed his skills during his apprenticeship, which would be three to five years, and had then become a boiler maker and had worked nights and had worked weekends and had endured furloughs and layoffs and things like that and worked his way up pretty close to the top of the seniority roster and then one day he's, he's laid off for good because the boilers are gone so they don't need him anymore. Sociologically, that had to be terrible. I was a pipe fitter and there was about 10 miles of pipe on those big locomotives. And every time I'd cut the branch pipes off and, the, and steam pipes, the injectors and the water pumps, and oh, this is a shame. Cut them up, cut all that stuff up. And we worked on them for years, you know, and they made our living for us. And uh, we just hated to see it happen. Engineers and firemen were luckier than back shop employees. They still had jobs. Crews were trained to operate the new locomotives, though it wasn't the same. When the diesels started to come, I had a regular job of firing, and I thought I'd never be cut off. And uh, the diesels took my job away from me for several years. The first diesels were just something that you really didn't, uh, really didn't want around. People that made these steam locomotives go were a different breed of animal than the people that make diesels go. It's, uh, it's a characteristic of the machine. The diesel locomotive is like an automobile. If you floorboard an automobile, you're gonna automatically get all the power that the engine can give you. If you put a diesel locomotive uh, in full throttle, you're gonna get all the power that that diesel can give you. But it wasn't necessarily so with the steam locomotive. The fellow that was gonna get the most out of a steam locomotive had to have a feel for the machine and had to have an ear for the way the machine was responding uh, through its exhaust. He, he had to literally be more of an engineer than a fellow did with the diesel. Running a steam giant was an art form on the verge of oblivion. Only railroaders born prior to World War II knew the intricacies of operating one. Vernon L. Smith began working around locomotives at a Minnesota iron mine in 1928 when he was 16. His career in railroading spanned 50 years. Among his proudest achievements was being a design engineer. He literally gave life to steam giants. The locomotive that I felt very strongly to was 3752 which was rebuilt on the Santa Fe and which can be considered the last steam locomotive built on the system. I was given the job to do the, all the engineering. She was finished on February 4th, 1948, a bitterly cold day. We weighed the engine and we took her out to the engine, engine house and uh, she was fired up. And uh, my wife came out with two, two boys to see the engine dad's engine and uh, I felt very strongly about it. Smith shared his experiences in a book about his life's work entitled One Man's Locomotives. On the cover is a picture of his Santa Fe steam giant number 3752. It was painted by a man who was touched by Vernon's passion for crafting excellence, his son. It was hard to feel indifferent towards a steam giant. 
Its clamor and belching smoke infuriated those with laundry drying on the line or someone in a deep sleep. But for countless others, the engineer's long whistle and the train's thundering roar were mesmerizing. They made the heart race. Rumbling steam giants conjured up worlds of wonder to rail fans, historians, and daydreamers. Any railroad was identifiable by its power more than it was by its day coaches or its signals or anything else. It is not the same since diesels. All the diesels may be painted differently, but underneath the paint, there's not that much difference between them. Not to us old diehards. There isn't. Today, small steam engines delight children in parks and vacationers on tourist lines. They give retired railroad men and women a chance to relive their days of glory. Only a handful of privately restored 484 steam giants remain. They'll occasionally pull a summer excursion train or make a guest appearance in a Hollywood film. A few years ago, a Norfolk and Western A-Class and a Union Pacific Challenger were restored and put into use in excursion service. But maintaining these giants is an expensive proposition. Both now sit in heated engine houses as their owners ponder what to do with the two largest operational relics of Steam's golden age. Many railroads donated numbers of their Steam giants to municipal parks and museums. But most giants fell to the scrapyard cutting torch. $200,000 locomotives were sold in chunks for pennies a pound. At the time, it signified progress. But in the tear-filled eyes of those who loved the giants, it was the end of an era and a way of life. Their fires were dropped decades ago, but the memories of their golden age live on. Future generations can look at what remains of these super locomotives and realize that not so long ago, railroads were a domain prowled by steaming giants. <laughs>